Hello and welcome. We are still talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. This has been such a good series. And we're going to begin today talking about His ministry within us. Some of the the personal benefits and some of the things that He wants to do in us and through us. You know, He's not just, you know, dwelling in us to sort of, you know, come along for the ride as as a silent observer. The Holy Spirit wants to influence and He wants to interact with us. He wants to lead us. He wants to guide us. And we're going to be talking about some of the things that He will do from within us. So if you don't have a Bible, just listen. If you have one, why don't you grab it, get a pencil so you can underline, maybe write some notes. And I think you're going to get some things from today's message that will help you in your walk with the Lord. So let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Ready for a little of the Word tonight? Good. We are talking about the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the precious Holy Spirit. Jesus, in talking to his disciples, they were very sad. You know, he said, you know, I'm I'm going away. And they, they couldn't work it out. And Jesus said, listen, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the helper can't come back. The comforter, the Holy Spirit... But if I go, he'll be sent to you. This is our third week of Bible study talking to you about the Holy Spirit. John's Gospel, the 14th chapter. And let's look in verse 16. We'll begin there. John 14 and verse... 16, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be where? In you. And when Jesus made that statement to the disciples, they understood that every other thing that he said about the coming Holy Spirit and about the Holy Spirit's ministry would be taking place for the most part from the inside out. He dwells with you, but he's going to be in you. And from this point, Jesus goes on and talks to them a lot about the Holy Spirit, about the Holy Spirit's ministry, but it was ministry that was to take place on their behalf, but from within and on the behalf of others through them, yet from the Holy Spirit's interior working in their lives. So let's let's look a little bit further about that Spirit's ministry within us as believers. Look in verse 26, the same chapter, John 14 and 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, he speaks of three things here in these these verses that the Holy Spirit does. And we're going to take it from the bottom up. And I want to talk to you about each one briefly. First of all, he gives us peace. Jesus, in verse 26, is talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He's going to come. And then he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. That is peace that Jesus is giving through the coming of the Holy Spirit. It is directly connected to the statement that he made just prior. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 14 and 17, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Kingdom is about righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. It's his peace. He said, my peace I give to you. It's not like the peace that the world has that is fragile and fleeting and is here one moment, it is gone the next. Circumstances are good. The sun is shining. You know, you got a bonus at work or this happened or that happened. And man, everything's great and you're feeling peaceful. But when the storm clouds roll in, the lightning flashes and the rain falls, suddenly the peace has flown out the window. It's not that kind of a peace that Jesus gives. This peace that comes from the Holy Spirit is supernatural in every respect. It is not dependent upon circumstances. and It's not dependent upon people being nice to you or not being nice to you. 
Anybody ever have anyone that's not been nice to them in your life? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I remember, and you know, I, I think the peace of God is revealed in our lives in different ways, but I can remember two things that happened to me as a young Christian, just I'm a brand new Christian, where I experienced this in what to me was a very unusual measure and something very tangible. Um, I've just come out of a, a whole world of drug addiction and alcoholism and running with crazy people. And, you know, I'm, I'm with Christians for the first time ever. And I didn't know there were hyper-religious mean Christians. There are some. You know, I just thought everybody was wonderful. And there was this guy that was just hyper-religious. He knew the Bible but it was a weapon to use against people that didn't, he didn't like or that didn't line up with some of his particular doctrinal nuances. And uh, so he used it as a club to club everybody. And he got kicked out of I don't know how many churches in town. I was in a meeting later on when they had to stop the whole meeting and you know, remove him from the meeting because he, he disturbed the meeting. And, and I'm just a new Christian. This, these things are all completely, you know, fresh to me. So I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm the dumb new Christian, like, this is awesome, you know, there's people singing to Jesus, and I'm in the service, and the guy zeroes in on me, and he comes over to me. I, you know, I'd met him once, and it was the weirdest, most beautiful thing. I'm standing there, and be, he's maybe three steps away, and it was like, you know, the cone of silence in Get Smart, you know, just like, Suddenly this presence enveloped me, this, this just like, wow, what's that? This peace. And then he came up and let me have it. For about five minutes, he yelled in my face and just, and I just stood there and smiled. It was like, I can't hear a word you're saying, but this is really cool. I cannot describe it, this, this amazing peace. And then, you know, he figured he'd done his, his uh, you know, butchery job on me and then he walked off and whoosh, that presence lifted off of me and I remember thinking to myself that was weird but that was really good and it happened to me one other time as a young Christian um, it's somebody I was I'd actually been witnessing to them and uh, was sitting in the seat a driver's seat of my little 63 Volkswagen bus and they walked up to me and I you know, open the window and same thing, whoosh, cone of silence, you know, it just, I, the, it was like a blanket of God's peace and presence and he screamed in my face. You could see the, the muscles bulging out in his neck and he screamed and screamed at me and I just smiled at him. And it, it freaked him out and he finally turned around and walked away, but it was just a manifestation of God's peace. And I, I remember, now, those are the only two times that has happened to me but I've experienced God's peace in, in a myriad of ways in my life, sometimes in the midst of so storms, sometimes just praying by myself. The presence of God comes in this, this supernatural peace. You just want to weep and say, God, you are good. You are good. You are good. I remember when we had uh, purchased the property over uh, on Sausalito Street, you know, our, our Sausalito campus, and um, it, was a, it was an enormous uh, purchase for us, and we were looking to borrow, I think at that time, $2 million from the bank, and that was like, you know, trying to borrow the moon to me at the time. In fact, I remember I went into the bank that we banked with, and I sat down with the vice pres who I'd gotten to know, and and uh, I said, you know, our church would like to borrow some money. She says, well, how much d do you need? She says, oh, we'd be happy to, Bayless. You guys are great customers. I said, $2 million. She turned as white as a sheet <laughs> and, and started to stutter when I said that to her. And uh, eventually, they actually did loan us the money we needed, and we paid it off uh, way, way early. But I remember thinking the night before I had to sign those papers, I was saying, God, I'm really scared. And if, if this doesn't work, they won't be able to find you, but they know where I live. <laughs> and I was like terrified 
to put my name on those documents, and yet I knew I had to do it the next morning or the deal was a bust. And I just prayed about it, prayed about it, and sort of, you know, tormented, actually, and I fell asleep. And the next morning, I woke up with a tangible sense of God's peace on my heart. It was the first thing I sensed when I woke up. I took that as a sign. God said, go for it. You know why? Colossians 3.15, the Amplified Bible says, let the peace of God act as an umpire in your heart, deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your mind. An umpire says, out of bounds, fair territory, that's a strike, that's a ball, keep playing, no, you, you know, you're, you're out, you, you're in, you're in a, an, an area that's not legal for you to be in, and, and the umpire was making a call, and I made some of the, the biggest calls in my life based on that peace that comes from the Holy Spirit. And I can say times like that, you know, where that happened, in all frankness, was not because of some great spirituality on my part, but I think honestly it's because people pray for me. It's because of the prayers of the saints. But Jesus said, hey, peace is going to come, and it is a work of the Holy Spirit. You know, when we obey Philippians 4, 6, it says, be anxious for... Of course, unless it's big, and then we know you can be anxious. No, it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. How many know that verse of Scripture? How many have any issues that are tempting you to be anxious right now in your life? Come on, I'm putting up both hands. If I could put up both feet and stand here, I would do it. There's stuff. And you know what? There's not even a promise in that that God will answer our prayer. We know he will because that's promised elsewhere. But it says, don't be anxious for anything, but let your request be made known to God, prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. And then here's what the next verse says. If you'll do that, the Holy Spirit will do this. And the peace of God, the peace of God, that supernatural peace that Jesus talked about, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If you'll talk to God about it, He promises to give you peace. If you'll do verse 6, He will do verse 7. And some, I, I just know, and this is not a word of knowledge, this is just by virtue of the fact of how many people are in here, I know there are some folks that you're here and you're at the breaking point right now. You've got stuff going on in your life and it's affecting you physically, it's affecting your appetite. It's affecting your sleep. It's affecting your ability to function. It's, it's robbing you of the joy of life. It's, those things are robbing you of the quality of life that God wants you to have. It may be affecting you the way you respond to your husband or your wife or as a, a parent to your children. And you know what? You need to have a talk with Jesus. God will give you peace. Jesus, it's your advantage I go away. When I come, the Holy Spirit's gonna come. He's gonna teach, he's gonna do these things but peace I'm giving to you. Not a fragile peace, not a fleeting peace like the world, but my peace I'm going to give to you. In Philippians 4, 6, you talk to God about it, offer Him thanks along with that prayer, and the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. Let's take a minute right now. Whatever you got going on, let's give it to God. Come on, church. Heavenly Father, we just come in Jesus' name. We got stuff going on in our lives, God. We're living in a fallen world. There's this renegade spirit called the devil that is our adversary who walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. God, some of us have made mistakes. We, we've done things and there's just, just issues going on. And Father, we know you're bigger than all of them. You're bigger than, the, bigger than the financial issues. You're bigger than the marital issues. You're bigger than, than the stuff going on with our kids. You're bigger than the health issues and you can take care of anything. God, we confess that the stuff we're facing is too big for us. It's beyond the scope of our ability to cope with it, but we look to you, God. You are big enough. And as the psalmist said, our soul silently waits for God alone. From him comes my salvation. From him comes my deliverance. And Lord, right now we put our eyes on you and we ask you to intervene in our behalf. And Father, as our hearts go up to you, and I, I know that, that specific requests are going up to you right now, Lord, we offer thanks. Our hearts say thank you. Thank you for hearing this prayer. Thank you for caring for us. 
Thank you for dispatching answers, Heavenly Father. We commit it into your hands right now. We release the burden from our heart, and we give it to you, O oh God. We give it to you with all of the stress, all of the worry, all of the preoccupation. God, we thank you for your peace right now that comes via the Holy Spirit. Lord, we may not know how things are going to work out, but we commit them to your hands to work them out. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. And I had a lady um, come to me after service one time. We'd actually prayed as a church. We'd stood up and prayed Philippians 4, 6 and offered God thanks. And I think we'd even gone through a physical motion of, you know, casting our cares on God. And um, she came to me, it was either a week or two weeks later, and um, I knew a little bit of her situation. Her husband had been deployed, and he was in a very, very dangerous uh, part of the world, uh, protecting our freedoms. And by the way, any military people in here or veterans, we want you to know we love you, and we are so grateful for what you do. Thank God for you. And if you have, if you've got a husband or a wife or kids or whatever that are, that are deployed or even, even serving here, uh, they may even be doing paperwork and correspondence and things, but listen, we appreciate the armed forces. Thank God for what you do. Thank God. We don't take it lightly. We don't. But her husband was deployed. He was in a, 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 a very dangerous area. A lot of our, our soldiers were, were being killed, and um, she had cast that care on God. And she came to me and, you know, talked to me about, you know, him being over there, and I knew he was there. She said, Pastor, you know, I... I haven't been able to sleep at all. Um, you know, I toss and turn. It's affected me in so many ways. I've just been tormented, you know, that, that uh, you know, he's not going to come home safe. But that Sunday, it was either the week or two weeks before, you know, I cast the care on God, said, and I have slept wonderfully every night. She says, I've never worried another moment about him. And, and it's, you know, I just have had peace on, on my heart. And, and she, she just sort of stopped talking. And I said, well, okay, what's, you know, what are you asking me exactly? She says, is that all right? She says, I feel really guilty, like I'm, you know, I, I should be worrying. I, I feel like something's wrong because I'm not worried anymore. And I said, no, you know what? She's just been a partaker of God's peace. And uh, she's feeling like she wasn't being a good wife if she wasn't worried anymore. But she had rolled that burden over on God. And whatever you rolled on God tonight, don't worry about it ever again. Now, the devil may run by your kitchen window with flashcards and say, look, 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 and try and get you to take it and refuse to take it. You just say, look, Mr. Devil, if you want to talk to someone about that, you're going to have to go talk to God because I gave it to him. He has it now, and I don't have it. So don't even touch it in your thought life. The only reason you, need to, you would need to touch it or do anything is if the Holy Spirit prompts you maybe to pray a certain way regarding it or, or maybe there'd be further prayer or if there's some action that you need to do or maybe spend some time praising or whatever. We're certainly open to anything that God wants to do, but not to, to take that worry and that burden again that's going to drag us down. You know, Jesus said, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I'm meek and lowly of heart. You'll find rest for your souls. Jesus is our burden bearer. And this precious Holy Spirit wants to bring us peace. All right, look back with me here in John 14. Once again in verse 26, and we're, we're moving up from, from the bottom. We start at verse 27. The second part of verse 26, Jesus said, He will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. Right? He'll bring to our remembrance all things that Jesus has said to us. Should you mark this place in your Bible and look with me in Acts chapter 11 if you would. I actually touched on this some months back in a message. But there is such a truth here, and it's, it's a subtle truth, but it's an important one. Peter has uh, had a vision Great sheet let down from heaven with unclean animals in it, things that according to the Mosaic law were unclean. Jews were not allowed to eat them. And the voice says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he, no, I'm not going to do it, Lord. Nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth. 
Happens three times, he's scratching his head, what's this about? At the, that moment, there's a knock at the door, there's some guys that have come from Cornelius' household, because an angel has appeared to a Gentile, a Roman centurion named Cornelius, said, look, send for Peter, he's gonna tell you words that you need to hear. So Peter goes with him, comes to Cornelius' household, preaches Christ, they get saved, the Holy Spirit falls on them, they all begin to speak with tongues, some prophesy, they baptize him in water, and so Peter comes back to Jerusalem, and he is in trouble. The Jews are, all the, Jew all the Christians, the Jewish Christians are extremely mad at Peter. Now here's 10 years after the day of Pentecost, and the, the church is still 100% Jewish. There are no Gentile believers at this point. A decade after Christ has been raised from the dead. Because G the apostles and the disciples themselves think that in order you know, to put your faith in Christ, you have to come through the doorway of Judaism. You have to be circumcised. You have to keep the, the law. You have to convert to Judaism. And only through that doorway can you be saved. And this is a whole new radical thing. A house full of Gentiles have just been saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And Peter says, hey, you know, who can forbid water? They, God gave them the gift of the Holy Spirit just like he gave us. They got to be just as saved as we are. And so they baptize him in Jesus' name. And he comes back to his home church in Jerusalem. And... Everyone is angry, especially certain factions of the church. In chapter 11, verse 1, Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. I mean, they were mad that Peter even went into their house. We read on in verse 4, but Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, and then he, he gives a blow-by-blow -blow description of everything that happened. Come to verse 15. He's still telling them what happened. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as, as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered. Everyone say, then I remembered. Amen. Then I remembered the word of the Lord Jesus. How he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave to us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. All right, they just got it right then. They just accepted the fact that Gentiles could be saved by faith in Christ alone. First time that the church has realized it. This is 10 years after the day of Pentecost. Now, when Peter said, okay, these things are happening in the house. It's against all of my training. It's against everything I've believed. It's completely new to me. He says, and then I remembered. Who brought that thought to his mind at that moment? The Holy Spirit. Jesus said, when he comes, one of the things he's going to do is bring to your remembrance all things that I've said to you. And it was the final nail in his argument. And they accepted it. Now, it's interesting to me that something that important, I mean, it's important to me because I'm one of the Gentiles, you know, in a future generation that's gotten saved. I I'm glad it hasn't been 2,000 years and they still haven't worked that out. That would be terrible, wouldn't it? So this, this is a pretty big deal. I mean, this like affects, you know, the whole rest of the world. And how does God let Peter know that his feet are on solid ground with this incredibly important issue? And what is one of Peter's arguments that settled it for everyone there? I remember. They knew Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will bring all things to remembrance that I have said to you. I think that's one reason it's so important as believers that you get the Word of God into you. You know, if you don't put it in, the Holy Spirit can't bring it out. Put it in when you don't need it, the Holy Spirit will bring it to you when you do need it. New Christians, devour your Bible. Old Christians, keep devouring your Bible. Get it inside of you. And the Holy Spirit, Spirit can bring it to your remembrance when you need it most. And, and you know, the Holy Spirit, whether it's through reading the words yourself, the words of Jesus, the other things God said in His Word, the Holy Spirit will use, use that. You sit in church where the Word is preached, the Holy Spirit will use that and bring those things back to your remembrance.
know, isn't that amazing? The Holy Spirit brings things to our remembrance. Of course, we can't remember something that we've never known, so it's our part to fill our hearts and our minds with the Word of God. And as someone wisely once said, if you will put the Word of God in your heart when you don't need it, the Holy Spirit will bring the Word out of your heart when you do need it. He brings to us, brings to our remembrance all things that Jesus has said unto us. I, for one, am very grateful for the Holy Spirit's ministry. You know, He is with me continually, as He is with you continually. He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. We can count upon Him in times of distress, in times of need. His ministry is real, my friend. This is not some, you know, fantasy world that has been made up. We can literally walk and talk with God and His Spirit can comfort us and illuminate us and guide us and strengthen us. This is the real deal, my friend. We are walking and talking with a God who created the universe. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, but I will come. I will take up my abode with you. He has come to us in the person of the Holy Spirit. The Father and the Son dwell in us through the person of the Holy Spirit. God communicates with us through the Holy Spirit. He enlightens us concerning His Word by the Holy Spirit. And if you've never received the Holy Spirit since you believed, and yes, you know, the new birth is, is a work of the Holy Spirit, but friend, there is more of the Spirit. It's one thing to be touched by the Spirit or born of the Spirit and something else to be filled with the Spirit, and God wants you filled. Stay with us because we'll be on this for a while, yet it's going to be a great series. God bless you. Do you have a yearning for more in life, to go deeper? Bayless Conley has something for you. Use the information on the screen or visit AnswersBC.org and to thank you for your gift of any amount to further the impact of the Answers broadcast on lives around the world. We'll send you a copy of Bayless Conley's booklet, The Infilling of the Holy Spirit. This new little book deals with uh, not just an important subject, but an important person. Jesus always referred to the Holy Spirit as He, not it. He told the disciples, you know, I know you're sad that I'm going away, but hey, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come back to you, and I will come in the person of the Holy Spirit. We can enrich you, bring power into your life, bring insight into your life, draw you closer to Jesus. I love the Holy Spirit. This little book uh, will bless your life, and I really, really would encourage you to get it. Use the information on the screen and to thank you for your donation of any amount to further the outreach of The Answers broadcast, we'll send you a copy of the Infilling of the Holy Spirit booklet, a simple book to jumpstart a powerful change in your life. Use the information on the screen or visit AnswersBC.org to request your copy of Bayless Conley's booklet, The Infilling of the Holy Spirit. And when you visit us online, remember that your donation to Answers is a vital part of helping us continue bringing our living Jesus to a dying world.